uh, and uh, one other person who was there to give us parliamentary reports. But more than that, to take away our suggestion and try and get things done was John McDonnell. I'll never forget him as an MP who does things. Thanks, Thanks. Um, um, I want to apologise first. I haven't been able to be here all day. Today is the Page Carnival, which most probably is not in your social diaries. And I appreciate that. Uh, but I'm the chair of it. Uh, it's an important community event in my community. Um, and the Tories have tried to close it down year after year, and we've been able to maintain it. And I just want, want to tell you why it was an important day to me today. We, we've set up a community group that come together and organise the carnival, despite all the cuts. And we proceed, we have a procession through Hayes Town. And think of my constituency, some of you have been there campaigning for me. Only 15, 20 years ago, we had a self-proclaimed group of councillors who were self-proclaimed racists and an extremely right-wing Tory MP. And it was one of those areas but we had to fight street by street to keep the National Front and the BNP out of the area. Well, today, um, the front of that carnival was led by the Hillingdon, the Hayes, Somali Women's Group. And they were... <laughs> and, they, and they were applauded from the pavement. That's the difference. They were applauded. And I just thought, it just, should, it just inspired that when a working class community stands up, you can actually show that and inspire people that you can show them a future that people want to achieve. And that was just so moving, right? and it was important that I was there. And I walked alongside them, and we were giving sweets out to children and all the rest of it. And it was just absolutely inspirational. Absolutely inspirational. And from my here today, that's what today has been. Today's been a delegate conference, it's not a rally, it's been a serious discussion about where we go forward. And I just want to give you my final views in the last three or four minutes. Um, well, first of all, I think we need to ex always express our solidarity with those in struggle and those at the moment are suffering as a result of that struggle. And I want to express my solidarity still in all of ours um, with Ed Willard, who was arrested, as you know, and then prosecuted and imprisoned as a result of the demonstrations last November. Francis Byrne, who was given a year's sentence yesterday for being drunk, basically, and just thrown a few sticks. And then all the other uncuts, UK uncuts, are coming up in court. We were with them last week and they're coming up in the coming months. And at the moment, you know what's happening. The courts now, to deter others from demonstrating, mm. the courts are imposing some of the severest sentences that we've seen against minor misdemeanors during demonstrations. So I think we should all from this conference send the message out to all those that have been prosecuted so far, all those who have been facing prosecution, that we stand with them today in solidarity. We stand with them. It's also been a, serious, it's been a serious discussion about the way forward. And can I just say, in our movement, you know, sometimes we don't thank people enough. To arrive at a situation where we've established an anti-cuts coalition of the Coalition of Resistance, where the right to work have been organised in mass demonstrations, but also where we've brought about attendance at one of the biggest demonstrations under the TUC in a generation, and then to follow that, despite all the scepticism, despite all the cynicism, with a huge turnout in terms of June 30th, rests upon the shoulders of all our rank and file activists who organise for those events. We, we should stand and congratulate them in solidarity as well. All of us, all of us in this hall, know it doesn't come easy. And I want to say thanks to people like Alex from the NUT left, the UCU left, Mark Sawak and the PCS left, and yes, Mary Barristow for the work that they did in delivering that fantastic start on the These things don't come easy. They took a lot of work, they took a lot of preparation, a lot of discussions, a lot of really yeah, inspiring people, lifting them and, and tackling some of the debates that you have in a union where people are anxious about taking industrial action. And I want to echo what Alex said. That march on the 30th, I've never been in an industrial action in the last 40 years where, first of all, the polls were 50-50. Usually it's 75% against us, 25 percent It was 50-50, which is an incredible demonstration of the wave of sympathy that was as a result of the work that was done by those trade unions, convincing people <coughs> of their argument. But also, when we marched on that day, there was an air of exhilaration. And I agree, you know, to have so many young teachers 
get up and talk about their dedication to their work, their commitment, their pupils, and then also to, to ally that with the campaign for a decent state pension as well as a, a, a trade union pension as well. I thought that demonstrated a real breakthrough in the movement. The first national petition launched that included a campaign for an industrial pension linked to an increase in the state pension, I think was a, a major breakthrough. And that came about not just from activists within the trade union movement, within the individual unions, but also from the National Pensioners Convention, Doc Gibson and all their colleagues who have worked so hard, dedicatedly, without any real acknowledgement over the last 10 or 20 years. I just say thanks for having me here. So let me just tell you where I think we're at. Over the last three years, we haven't just seen a ripple of minor events. We've seen a crisis in the class establishment of this country, in every section of it. It started with the bankers and the banks' crisis, then with the political crisis, the politicians flipping their expenses, the crisis of credibility that brought about in the political system. It's now moved on to the media linked to the political system. Murdoch has supposedly flown in today to sort of try and solve things. I, was, I tweeted, well, it just makes it easier to arrest him for questioning when he comes in <laughs> and he throws. Bizarrely on Twitter, and that's what Twitter does these days, there's a whole group of lawyers now who will likely be arrested. I'm not going to be arrested. It's extraordinary. So we started off a whole new debate about the crimes we can charge him with. <laughs> well, one is actually launching class war on our class for the last 20 years, quite honestly. It will, it will now, it's now moved into a crisis in the policing establishment. I tell you the information that's coming out on the bribery between News International and the police looks as though it isn't just going to be a small number of coppers. I think it will go right the way up to the higher echelons of the police force, who turned a blind eye not just to the receipt of bribes, but also turned a blind eye to close down investigations into the corruption that's gone on within our police service as well. Even within the military now, there's a crisis of who they can invade next and how they can't invade anywhere more because they haven't got the resources. And we have the military falling out amongst themselves. All it needs now is the church to have a sex scandal and that's the whole lot of it. <laughs> so I think we need to recognise that the establishment is in crisis. And that gives us, again, another opportunity in the same way the financial crisis does. You see, I don't want to just bring down the government anymore. I want to destroy the system. Because it is a system now that people are recognising is this destroying their lives. It's the system now that's causing the poverty and inequality and the cuts. So now we're challenging the system itself. That's what we need to do. It isn't just about replacing one government with another. It's challenging the whole basis upon which we organise ourselves economically, socially and politically. And that's the debate we've started and we're now in. How do we move it forward? Just briefly in two minutes. Obviously we've discussed today that we move it forward, first of all, by the action that we take. The industrial action that we take in the coming period is, I think is going to be absolutely pivotal. We all pledge ourselves, don't we, to ensure that we support every piece of industrial action that we possibly can. That we talk within our own unions to ensure that we're properly mobilised when that fight takes place. But also within those unions that are bureaucratised, and let's be honest, there are some unions that are so bureaucratised now, they restrict their members from taking any form of democratic decision making or action. We should be working within them as well in solidarity to free them, to free them so they can express their views as rank and file members, and yes, take the appropriate action when necessary. And we know, I've heard we've had a debate about a general strike today, but the reality is, isn't it? that when we take coordinated action, we are that much more effective. So the work in this coming period, it's the point that Alex made, it's about careful, constructive engagement in each of our unions, but then making sure when we promote our own union activity, that we promote it right away across the piece. We establish the TUC to TUCG to ensure that that discussion takes place. We now need to drive that further into the TUC itself. So in the autumn, yes, we go for the coordinated action, but we do it in a way that we're saying to government, this isn't just one day. This isn't just one tokenistic strike that happens. We want to bring people out and keep them out until our demands are met. Whichever demands there are, the patients, wages, and the staff. 
Now that takes, that takes hard work. That takes hard work. That takes a lot of reasoning, a lot of argument. It takes a lot of inspiration to give people that courage. But I don't think there's any other way of doing it now. And I'll tell you why. In the last week, every statistical report on the economy is demonstrating either we're in for a long period of scraping along the bottom of economic activity or within six months we'll be back into recession. By the autumn, Osborne will be coming back for another round of cuts. There will be another round of jobs going, more services cut. And I don't know what it's like in your constituency at the moment, but I've got the last numbers of people now completely suspended from benefit. We're circulating food parcels. You saw the dispatches program during the week, some of you, about the Rathbunite landlords in housing. That was next to my constituency, that the same landlords cramming people into overcrowded conditions, living in appalling conditions that we haven't seen since the Second World War. We've got people now sleeping on the canal embankments in my area because they're homeless. I don't think we can take any more. That's why when they come back for more cuts in the autumn, I think that's the line in the sand. I don't think we can stand back anymore. I think we've got to take them on. And it's not a matter of being hyperbole or exaggerating the situation. It's actually saying this is it. And that does mean mobilisation. And the only best, the best mobilisation we know is the trade union solidarity. The individual unions take an action and we support them and then try to combine that trade union action in a coordinated way. Whether you call it coordinated action or general strike or whatever, I think it's almost becoming inevitable now if we're going to protect our class from this, these attacks. Can I also say the other forms of challenge, obviously a direct action. I think now we've seen how effective direct action could be. I think we should put the message out very straightforwardly. Any institution or any individual that attacks our class, we will come for you with direct action. We will close you down. We will expose you. We'll sit on your lawn. We'll come into your offices. We'll come to wherever you are to confront you, to confront you. Because, as UK and others have demonstrated, the only way we can expose them is that form of direct action that gets in their face. The government aren't going to sit back and allow this just to happen. They're just going to, not going to roll over. Already, as you know, they're planning the anti-trade union legislation to undercut the abilities of trade unions to organise, to try and increase the thresholds of industrial powers. But we're also, they were going to launch it on Monday, they're pulled back now by the sound from the Murdoch, well, what's happened with Murdoch. They're also going to launch the, the consultation on anti-squatting wars. And it isn't just about moving into properties to, to live and all the rest of it, although that's desperately needed at the moment. But it's also anti-squatting laws which will make illegal occupations by students and occupations by workers to criminalise them. So the government now is basically using the law as, a, as a, a tool of class warfare on a scale that we've not seen maybe since the 80s, certainly. Well, I warned them, and I warned them, give them this message. If you use those weapons, if you use the law against us, we will have no other option, no other option but to resist by civil disobedience. And if that means going out on the streets, if that means occupations that will then be declared illegal, if that means supporting workers who are occupying their factories or the public services that are being cut, we need to make very, very clear to tell them we will be there. We will be there because we're there to protect our class. That's what this is all about. It's a class struggle. They're coming to destroy everything that we've fought for for generations. Everything that we learned about in the 30s and we put in place under the Atlee government, every element of the welfare state, every proposal that we put forward to protect our people from poverty, whether in young, whether it's education, whether it's health or whether it's just welfare benefits, they're coming for us. And we've got to say from meetings like this every time, we're going to stand firm, we're going to stand in solidarity, because that's the only two things we need, isn't it? Two things, courage and solidarity. That's the message from today's conference. Solidarity.